Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Macmillan Education Iberia event, Building a Bilingual Future, starting in pre-primary. My name is Louise Connolly, and I'm the events manager at Macmillan Education Iberia. I would like to thank you all for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to join us here this evening. I see that we have many viewers from Spain and Portugal, but also from other countries, including Turkey, uh, Saudi Arabia, the UK, and also, um, uh, I think as well, the USA. And there may be some other countries as well that I've missed out. So um, I really want to welcome you all. Thank you for joining us from all different parts of the world. It's wonderful to have you all here today. This is a very special event. We're delighted because we have uh, Carol Reed here, to, who is the author of Big Wheel or Mimi's Wheel or Ferris Wheel. Uh, Carol has been has specialized in, in, in ELT for, well, for the last over 30 years as a teacher, teacher trainer, academic manager, um, author and educational consultant. She uh, specializes, as you all know, in early years and primary English language education. And her recent publication, her most recent publication, I mean most recent because there are many others for both pre-primary and primary that she has published with Macmillan Education. But Big Wheel or Mimi's Wheel or Ferris Wheel is the latest uh, publication for pre-primary. During Carol's talk, which is uh, Wheels of Learning, Key to Preschool Success Now and in the Future, you will have the opportunity to interact with Carol. Uh, we will launch a couple of interactions, which are called Have Your Says. These will appear on your screen. And all you have to do is write a short response to the question posed. We'll also, at the end of Carol's talk, allow a space for you to ask questions. So we'll have a question and answer um, slot. Um, so basically, Carol's talk will be from 6.05 to 7.05, followed by the question and answer slot. And then at 7.15, I'll invite my colleague, uh, Susanna Lopez, to come on so that she can do a short presentation of uh, Big Wheel with you. And I just want to say that we will be recording this event. We will send the recording as well as a certificate of attendance in approximately one week's time to you all. And at the very end of the event, I will invite you to participate in a very short SurveyMonkey questionnaire is so that you can give your opinion on the event, on the experience and also there's a question there if you're interested in finding out more about this wonderful course big wheel um, for pre-primary we will get in contact with you and explain it in more detail so with no further ado i would like to say Welcome, Carol. Thank you so much for joining us here this evening. It's a real pleasure. And I've missed doing webinars with you. So I'm delighted <laughs> that in 2021, I have the opportunity again to, 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 to be here with you. Thank you. That's great. No, thank you very much, Louise, for that lovely introduction. It's lovely for me to be here with you. And thank you to everybody for coming. Um, you know, preschool teaching has long been a passion of mine. And um, in this webinar, I've selected to share with you six key areas that I really think help children get ahead learning English in preschool and lay solid foundations for their future learning and their lives. And the areas that we're going to look at are these. You can see them all there. I'm not going to read them all. I'm not going to read them out, but you can read them. And I'd like to start off with the blue pod in the top right. So the role of games and play. So 
we play games all the time in the classroom. We play games with flashcards, we play games with real objects, we play games with our puppet, of course, we play games with our feely bag, maybe. And games have explicit rules and thinking skills involved in following and applying the rules. And games are usually adult or teacher led. So for example, a practical example might be a what's missing game with flashcards or real objects. And here in this case with food vocabulary. So are you ready? What's missing? Everybody ready to tell me? Okay, what's missing? Yes, of course, you're right. It's the tomato. Are you ready for another one? Looking closely, ready? It's the chocolate. Fantastic. Okay, or we might play a memory game and I might cover all of the objects, all 10, and see um, if the children can remember them all. Okay, so that actually, um, there are big differences between games and play. Play is make-believe, pretend, free. It's sometimes called symbolic play. And this is the kind of play where children create imaginary situations in which they take on and act out roles. And it's usually child initiated. So children learn by imitating, experimenting, problem solving, making their own decisions. And a practical example of play might be playing house with imaginary friends and family. <clears throat> and I think it's important for us to be aware of how games and play contribute differently to children's development. So in terms of cognitive development, games with rules develop the ability to follow instructions. They also develop cognitive skills, such as logical deduction, matching, or memory, as we just saw in the little game now. Whereas play, on the other hand, develops the ability to think creatively and flexibly, to solve problems, to manage relationships with other people, and develop empathy. In terms of language development, they're also different too. Games with rules, we usually have a specific focus on learning vocabulary or structures and repeated practice, listening to instructions and listening to others. Whereas play offers a context for children to take risks and communicate using all the language that they have available. In terms of cells, social and emotional learning, of course, games with rules provide experience with emotional issues such as learning to lose a game and also learning to conform to rules and norms, learning to cooperate and take turns, learning about the concept of fairness and actually to respect that. Whereas play offers different opportunities, certainly opportunities also for social development in terms of empathy, listening to others, turn-taking, collaborating, and also rehearsal at managing emotions and conflict and develops autonomy and responsibility. So actually, we need a balance of both for children to really get ahead. And of course, we're likely to use many more teacher-led games than child-initiated play in our lessons, since they provide targeted language practice, they're much easier to manage and control, and children are less likely to use their mother tongue. At the same time, it is important for us to try and provide some balance and give opportunities to children for play as well. And we can do this by an emphasis on games, especially at first, and the creation of familiar formats. Now, a format, this is based on the work of Jerome Bruner, and he talks about a format as a routinized and repeated interaction in which an adult and a child do things to and with each other. In other words, to put this in straightforward language, 
all the activities, games, routines, dialogues, and repeated exchanges that we use in our lessons over and over again provide a model and scaffolding for children to improvise and develop their own creative versions when they have an opportunity for free play. For example, at some point, we may play a flashcard game or with real objects like what's missing with every lexical set we introduce. And children become so familiar with the procedure and the language that they are able to lead the game themselves. And this is what Bruna calls the handover principle. In other words, the increase in the children's independent role as you withdraw. So let's see how formats work in practice and how this can really help us to get children ahead learning English. Following Bruna, formats consist of a structure, roles, and a script. And the teacher, we, are the mediator in creating the structure, role, and script and engaging children in repeated play-like activities which children join in, memorize, internalize, and then use in their own play. So let's have a look at a couple of examples. So the first one, okay, um, an action rhyme using the puppet Mimi, okay. So the structure is essentially, you've got to behave yourself, Mimi. We're online, you know, you've got to be a good girl, okay. So the structure is a set of realization rules by which the game is managed. In other words, it's basically what we do, okay. So, and the role is the role that you play and your puppet, for example. So in this one, it's the teacher with the puppet and the game may be simply with a beckoning signal, follow, follow, follow me, walk, 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 one, two, three. Okay, everybody, and follow, follow, follow me, jump, 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 one, two, three, and so on. So that kind of action game that we could repeat with many, many different kinds of actions. Let's have a look at another example here. And this is an example based on the big wheel mat. Um, if you didn't have a big wheel mat, you don't have to worry. You could sort of turn the flashcards over or something. You can see I've got the big wheel mat actually behind me here. You might be able to see it. So in this one, very simply, um, the teacher puts the flashcards face down in the pockets and invites the children to take turns to guess the flashcards. So, for example, what's in the blue pocket? Can you guess? It's a car. Yes, yes, yes. Or no, it isn't. Okay. And obviously, with that positive feedback, you're right. Very good. And so actually what we're talking about here, the key to children to getting ahead is to create these repeated scenarios or formats that give children confidence and familiarity in using language. And this allows them to internalize language and make it their own. But we mustn't stop there, or if we can possibly not, we want to take it a step further because we want to give children opportunities to use language in their own creative ways during free play. And one way to do this is through creating learning stations. Now, a learning station is a space in the classroom with materials and resources which you have used in teacher-led games, which are made available for children to play with. So for example, a learning station might include a class puppet and a set of flashcards, or it might include story cards and small picture cards, or paper and crayons, or tablets and headphones, and so on. Now, the idea is that children take turns to alternate completing an activity at their table to visiting learning stations you've set up 
in pairs or small groups. Pairs, much easier to manage. You only need to create one or two learning stations, one new one at the time. And at the end of each unit, and depending on the number of children you have and the layout of your classroom, you may decide to devote a whole lesson to getting children to play at different learning st stations. You need to encourage children to play in English, but encourage, not insist, and also for them to use our quiet voices. And the benefits are they provide you with an opportunity to work with and give extra support to small groups of children who are not at the learning station in turn. And it's important for you not to interfere, but you can eavesdrop and get feedback on how children play and how they're using the language. And there are advantages in terms of developing children's autonomy and responsibility. And you can see for yourself because what tends to happen, and I promise this is true, you just have to try it. Children tend to replicate the activities that they've done with you in class. All those games, those formats that they're so familiar with. They use chunks of language they've learnt. They actually, they're very strict about correcting each other very often and helping each other. And in my experience, one of the favourite activities that children like playing in a learning station is playing teacher. So we can see there how our structured, controlled activities are so important in repeating and over and over and giving children this internal resource for using language um, themselves. Now, stories, let's move on to the next um, area that we're going to have a look at. There it is in green there, learning through stories. And I'm sure I don't have to convince any of you out there how powerful a vehicle our stories are for developing language skills, thinking skills, sequencing, deducing, predicting, creative thinking, and also, of course, social and emotional learning, empathy, imagination, deliberate memory, cultural awareness, all, all these things. And plus, of course, and perhaps you might say most importantly, they give sheer pleasure and enjoyment. So let's have a look at an example now of a story. And um, I'm going to tell you this story. <clears throat> and what I'd like you to do is to actually think about, while I tell you the story, what features of the story support children's learning. And at the end of the story, as Louise mentioned earlier on, we'll have um, a have your say, and I'd love you to contribute your ideas. So this story then is actually called um, Let's Go by Bye. Okay, and there are Mummy and Daddy, Mimi and Dylan, and they're going to Grandma and Grandpa's house. Oh, great, says Mimi. I love Grandma and Grandpa. Let's go by bike. Oh, yes, please, says Dylan. I want to go by bike too. Come on then, says Mummy. Let's go by bike. Hooray! Thank you. Oh dear, it's raining, says Daddy. We can't go by bike, says Mummy. Oh no, says Mimi. I've got an idea. Let's go by car. Oh yes, please, says Dylan. I want to go by car too. Come on then, let's go by car. Hooray! Thank you. Oh dear, look at the wheel. We can't go by car. Oh no, I've got an idea. Let's go by train. Oh yes, please. I want to go by train too. Come on then, let's go by train. Hooray! Thank you. Oh dear, the train is full. 
we can't go by train. Come on then, says Daddy. Let's go home. Oh no! I want to go to Grandma and Grandpa's house. Me too, says Dylan. Please, Mummy. Please, Daddy. No, sorry. We can't go to Grandma and Grandpa's house today. Let's go home. Oh! Oh, look! Here's Mrs. Cat and the school bus. I've got an idea," says Mimi. "Let's go by bus." Hello, Mrs. Cat. Hello, Mimi. Hello, Dylan. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Mercat. Hop on. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Cat. We want to go to Grandma and Grandpa's house. No problem. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Cat. Hello, Grandpa. Hello, Grandma. Hello, Mimi. Hello, Dylan. Come in and bring all your friends. It's time for a snack. Oh, thank you, Grandma. Thank you, Grandpa. Come on, everyone! Hooray! Okay, <laughs> so there's the story, and now have your say. I'd love to know yeah. what you that think. That was wonderful, what? Carol. You had <laughs> us enthralled there. I wanted to participate. I wanted to get involved. I was almost about to jump in and <laughs> say that. <laughs> okay, so so right. what what features of the story support children's learning? That's Please exactly. contribute your that, ideas. Absolutely. Please write your answers now. The question is on your screen. What features of the storytelling support children's learning? And let's see. We'll just give people a couple of seconds to do that. I loved, I, you know, it was kind of, there was a cliffhanger, you know, again and again. <laughs> so what's going to happen? And 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 it was it was wonderful. I really did want to um, take part. So we've got some repetition, uh, lots lovely. of structures. We're lovely. also getting some lovely comments, Carol. People saying that was very very nice. Um, they've enjoyed it. Different, um, let's see, different voices. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, and, and the repetition there. The repetition is repeating, <laughs> is being repeated a Absolutely. lot by people. Absolutely. Teachers' voice as well, and the, 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 the use of vocabulary. And right. I would add one myself, the idea of, well, apart from language, um, the idea of putting forward solutions to problems, so problem solving, coming Absolutely. up with an yes. solution. Yes, the kids they're full of ideas, is, Mimi is, and Dylan. They're full of ideas. And kids, when, the, when, when they really want to do something, I remember when I was a kid and something wasn't going to happen, then you would come up with ideas. Oh, but we could, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, yes, it's a very natural response, isn't it? Um, okay, that's fantastic. Yes, fantastic. Thank you, Okay, everybody. wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Well, what I want what I want us to look at now, and that's fantastic. All your ideas, is how we um, scaffold children's less learning from the story. Because you mentioned a lot of you about the the repetition, and um, that of course is cru crucial. And so, what I want us to have a look at now is to go on to the next um, pod on the wheel, and to actually look at questions and other scaffolding techniques. Now, scaffolding is um, the metaphor used to describe the support that children need to carry out activities and lead them to greater understanding and more independent learning. As the metaphor implies, scaffolding can be put up or taken down according to children's capabilities and needs. It can also be applied differently to individual children. And of course, it can be applied 
differently if we're working in a context where we want our children to really get ahead um, in English. So, in a story like this, the typical questions that get asked at this age is going to be things like, who's this? Mimi. What color is the bus? Yellow. Very good. Is it raining? Yes. Now, these questions are really important in allowing children to display what they know, but they don't take thinking any further and also language. So these kinds of questions are really important for encouragement and participation, but they are limiting if we don't move beyond this. And the important thing for us as teachers is to think about the questions you're going to ask and the kind of thinking skills you want to develop before you tell the story. And I would also say that if you ask too many questions, it spoils the flow and enjoyment of the story. You can also address diversity in your classes by directing different questions to different children, depending on their confidence and competence. And obviously, if you understand the children's shared language, which I know that most of you here do, you can also ask some questions and accept responses in that too. So let's have a look at um, examples of possible questions in relation to the story that we've just done. And I think it's important for us to um, relate the thinking focus to the questions. So I'm not going to read all of those out there, but you can see, for example, the sequencing, the third one down, where, you know, how do they try and go first? And then, okay, so that's actually sequencing, understanding chronological order. And also, of course, it's the recall of, of the story. Um, and we also have, you know, at the, the last one there, future hypothesizing, or I could have actually put creative thinking there. Um, what do they do at grandma and grandpa's house? What snack do they have? How do they go home? Do they go home by Mrs. Cat's bus or do they go home another way? Okay, so that questions have a very important role in our scaffolding. In other words, in moving children's understanding of the language of the story to actually being able to produce it themselves. And we can also use many other tools for scaffolding. And one that I always love using is song as scaffolding. Because very often with young children, song provides a transition or a bridge from understanding the language in the context of the story to children using it themselves. And with an activity like this, they may first listen and point to the pictures and then do the actions and then act out in two groups. So let's listen to the song and do the actions now. And if you're at home, Listen, I can't check that you're and doing sing, it. Try. I want to go by bike. I want to go by bike. By bike. Oh, yes, please, me too. Come on, then. Let's go by bike. I want to go. Come on then, let's go by car. I want to go with you. I want to go by train, by train. Oh yes, please, me too. Come on then, let's go by train. Come on then, let's go by bus. I want to go with you. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Yay! 
Okay, so, <laughs> so <laughs> in a, a song that you're very good, beautifully acted, beautifully no, acted well, out, Louise. <laughs> well, more or less, more or less. Fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that song, and um, you please will have to forgive me if you if you go around singing it. You have it in your head all <laughs> evening because I they're very do. catching. They're very catching these songs. Okay, but so that song we're beginning to see how children are starting to use you know the key language from the story and um another element technique for scaffolding is to actually use it again so for example in our circle time we might have flashcards face up on the carpet and invite one child to pick up a card and say i want to go by plane okay or just plain, you know, because the children may not be able to say the whole chunk. Some of them will. Okay, we'll be encouraging that. And then we get another child to respond, me too. Okay. And then what the children do is they stand up and they go around the circle and um, pretending to be in whatever vehicle they've decided. And in a little game like that, they can use more or less language in the exchange. But this is building up. This is preparing the children, leading them towards feeling confident about doing a story dialogue or role play. And as we can see here, this is again where the idea of the format comes in. In the same way that we saw with games, we can scaffold children's learning by creating these formats, which are used repeated language and based on the interactive exchanges in the story. And we build it up to a dialogue or role play that we can do um, with the whole class, with half the class, and it's based on the story and using our flashcards. So I want to go by bike. Oh yes, please, me too. Come on then, let's go by bike. Oh no, we can't, okay. Let's go by car and so on. So actually, we're leading the children from that receptive understanding of the language in the context of the story to actually using it and acting it out themselves. And then, of course, if you have a learning station and in your learning station, you put your story cards or your flashcards, you know, the children are likely um, to repeat the kinds of activities that you've done um, in, in the whole class teacher led activities. And this moves us on to the next really important area for us to consider. And this is here, um, in yellow. And this is early interactive speaking skills. And this, <clears throat> I think, is particularly important if we're working with children who are having more time and we really want them to get ahead and we want them to begin to be able to interact using language chunks rather than just discrete items of vocabulary. And I think some of the key points to mention here is that children need frequent repeated models to imitate and copy. There is no way round this. This is what we need for learning a new language, getting our tongues and our heads and our brains around the sounds. So frequent repeated models. And they also need repetition of the same language in different contexts. Recycling, if you like. But, you know, so for example, a chunk like, can I have? You know, we might use it in relation to the flashcards, to classroom objects, um, to the books, to giving out materials. OK, uh, another key point is that we need to give positive feedback and encouragement. But, you know, we can't push this and we can't oblige if children are not ready. So the, there's no there's no question of obligation because that will just you know, put up, put up the barriers. Um, in fact, what we need is more frequent models, more frequent teacher-led games or whatever. And I would also say another thing I would say that I think sometimes we shy away 
from because maybe we think it's not um, meaningful, but don't shy away from choral repetition. And we can always make choral repetition, you know, fun. I mean, we can repeat it in a happy voice and in a sad voice and in a soft voice. I mean, there are, there are ways that we can do it to make it very play-like and ludic, if you like. So I think one of the first areas of early interactive speaking skills that we can think about is in relation to the whole area of learning routines. And just to give an example now with a learning routine that I'm sure all of you um, do, you know, it's a very common learning routine. We all do this. You know, we go um, to the we go to the classroom window. We look out of the in window. We ask, "What's the weather like today?" And we hold up a flashcard and we go, "Is it sunny today?" And we we model the answer and we encourage the children to say with you, "No, it isn't." Okay. Then we repeat with other flashcards. Is it rainy? No, it isn't. Is it windy? No, it isn't. Is it cloudy? Yes, it is. Okay. And what happens with that as the children become familiar with the language and the routine, what happens is actually you no longer need to use the flashcards when you ask children the questions and they will respond. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. In a, as, a, as a chunk, as a language chunk, they can't break it up, of course, without your prompting. And after more time, they'll also learn to respond directly to the question. So actually, you'll go over to the window and you'll say, what's the weather like? And they'll say, it's sunny, okay. And so actually, you've moved that routine on. And more confident children may then also be able to lead the activity instead of you, the handover principle that I mentioned earlier. And of course, when you do that weather routine, you know, you can also allow for creative responses. Um, I always, <laughs> I love one day a child in my class, I, you know, what's the weather like today? And he said, it's sunny, cloudy, sunny, cloudy. Because, um, of course, we don't, we don't have a word for when it's sunny, but there are also clouds in the sky. And so he'd created that compound description, which was wonderful. Okay, so learning routines, really important for initial interaction skills, as are <coughs> videos. Videos, because the wonderful thing about videos is that they give children real life models that they can relate to. So, for example, children might watch a video of Sam and Anna there asking Uncle Dan about food. So, let's just watch this now and find out what does Dan like. Come on, Sam. Come on, Anna. Let's make lunch. What food do you like, Uncle Dan? Oh, yes. Tell us, Uncle Dan. Well, I like milk and I like eggs. Do you like bread, Uncle Dan? No, I don't. I don't like bread and I don't like cereal. Do you like apples? Yes, I do. I like apples and I like bananas. Do you like carrots, Uncle Dan? No, I don't. I don't like carrots, but I like ice cream. It's a treat. How about you? Do you like ice cream? Yes, I do. Me too. It's yummy. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, so in a little video like that, and of course, children, you know, they get to know these characters, Sam and Anna and Uncle Dan. But the reason I really wanted to, I mean, obviously, there's listening practice there. And then we would obviously get them to report back the food that Dan likes, you know, he likes milk, eggs, apples, bananas, ice cream, of course. Okay. Um, and I didn't ask, as you noticed, I didn't ask children to think about what he doesn't like as well because that's quite that's quite challenging for children to think of both at the same time so but what I wanted to use this to show you was that actually don't shy away from you know when we've watched the video and we've got them on our screen say let's let's ask that Uncle Dan about the food he likes and get the children to ask you the questions in to ask the questions with you in chorus so, do you like bread, Uncle Dan? Do you like eggs, Uncle Dan? Do you like apples, Uncle Dan? Okay, and um, the children are repeating those questions to Uncle Dan in the same way that Sam and Anna do. You can also then get them to ask you the questions. So, we've got this repetition practice but it's really important because what we're actually doing is laying the foundations for children to then be able to do a little role play and actually ask each other um, in pairs and later on if you set up a learning station for example with plastic food like the food i used in the what's missing activity at the start of the session you're likely to find that what the children will do is pretend to be Uncle Dan, Sam and Anna. So I think what we have to remember to get to that communication, we need those very clear stepping stones on the way. And it's this that gives children the confidence and familiarity to use chunks of language and move beyond just um, vocabulary, for example. And one other thing I would like to say in relation to this area, and this is in terms of preparing children for interaction, because it actually helps to be explicit about what's involved. Children need to know what, what actually do you want them to do. So here is a little song, you know, it's a kind of ask a question, ask a question, say the answer, yes or no, take turns with your partner, off you go, off you go. Okay, so we've actually, we're actually setting it up in a very explicit way. And this supports children's learning. They need to know very clearly what to do. So moving on now to our next area on the wheel. And this is social and emotional learning, okay? And this is obviously a major area of learning for all of us, not only children. And I would like us to start off by sharing our thoughts and ideas. What do you understand by social and emotional learning? So if we back to Louise yes. and another yes. have your say here it will be fantastic. This is a second have your say. As Carol said, the question is now on your screen. And the question is, what do you understand by social and emotional learning? And you can write short answers. You don't need to write complete sentences. Short answers are words, fine. Yeah. We'd yeah. love words, exactly, key words. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your ideas, what you understand by social and emotional learning. So we'll give you a couple of seconds for that. Okay. Let's just see. There's some answers coming in. There is an answer, yes. Ask the pupils, how are you today? So finding out from the pupils, helping people, helping others. Um, manners, I suppose, you know, being polite, being respectful, friendship as well. Great. Empathy, expressing empathy. Lovely. Towards others. Lovely. Uh, skills, uh, somebody sort of defined it as being skills we need to understand and manage emotions. Fantastic, lovely. That's a nice 
um, Absolutely. way of encapsulating it, isn't it? Teaching the ability to identify and modify your emotions as well as recognizing the emotions of others, building a sense of community, fantastic. Fantastic. Values Lovely. education, motivation to learn, lots of great ideas coming in. Thank you very much, everybody. Fantastic. And I, I think that's absolutely all your ideas have really captured the way that social and emotional learning is this kind of umbrella term. And it is actually so important. It really underpins children's confidence, their self-esteem, and their physical and mental well-being. And it's really an essential foundation for their thinking um, and, and learning. And um, I'd just like to share with you now a definition of social and emotional learning, um, which I think it just captures it very well. So there it is. I'm not going to read that out, but just have a little moment to read it. So, and also it captures, that definition captures a lot of the things that you also mentioned. So it's a hugely um, important area. And I think what we need to think about is how we develop children's social and emotional learning and essentially I think there are two ways and the first way is if you like by osmosis it's actually looking for every opportunity to develop and enhance cell within all aspects of our everyday teaching um, but also we can use explicit instruction and specific activities so let's have a look at the osmosis side to start off with. And this is not rocket science, but at the same time, it is hugely important that children feel valued and cared for by the teacher, an environment that is colorful and stimulating, that are not, not overstimulating, um, that also values their, their work, displays of their work, and things like birthday charts and um, can you guess the baby? And also, of course, we use, you know, we use our puppet to also set up the warm and caring learning environment as well. Um, the next thing, through modeling and by example. And modeling actually going through the language process and the thinking process that children need to know before they do an activity. It's all very obvious to us, but it isn't to children. So we need clear demonstrations. We also need, of course, praise, positive encouragement and feedback. And our praise needs to focus on effort and behavior as well as um, just achievement. And also, we need to use descriptive praise so that children actually understand what it is that they've done well. And that builds up their social and emotional bank of things they know about themselves that they can do. We need to set clear expectations and parameters. And I think I've mentioned this in a way indirectly already that children have a right and a need to know what we expect of them and the boundaries for behavior. And of course, we do this through our lesson routines and our lesson plans, um, which frame this when we're, when we're teaching. We also need to have um, a positive, proactive rather than reactive approach to classroom management. We need to train children in good um, social and good learning habits. And this is obviously built up through learning routines, through values education, and through social and emotional learning. We also need to provide children with opportunities for choice and decision making. And this doesn't need to be big decisions. But for example, it might be, you know, which activity we do now. Do you want to sing, do you want to sing the song about transport or shall we play a game? Or the order of activities or how to complete a project, whether with crayons or, or paint, if you have that option. 
And this develops children's self-esteem, their responsibility and investment in their own learning. And leading on from that, we also need to provide opportunities for agency and autonomy. For example, in the development of life skills, you know, putting on your own coat and shoes. And this helps develop um, self-regulation and self-management. And also, of course, age-appropriate cell-related activities. That's the explicit way that we're going to have a little look at now. And one more thing that I would mention here, and that is um, integrated values education that actually um, explicitly develops um, things such as kindness, respect, effort, willingness to help others, and so on. So let's have a look at a few examples of specific activities that we might do. And here's one for our very littlest learners, our three-year-olds. I just, I just love the picture of them in the mirror there because, because this is a diversity classroom. And um, one thing that I have, and which is very useful actually, is I have a sort of class set of um, plastic. They're not break breakable. They're not very good quality. Little um, like handbag mirrors. Um, and um, so what children do is they, they actually, they look at themselves in the mirror and they point and say, my eyes are special. My nose is special. My mouth is special. I'm happy I'm me. And there's a song that they can sing with it. And then they draw a self-portrait. And um, the teacher, you can show the pictures of the class and comment positively on the features and children guess who they are. And this is a lovely way of building up their um, self-esteem. Also, um, awareness of feelings. This is really, really important that children become aware of their feelings and other people's feelings. And this song that we're not actually going to sing now, but you can see the text there. Um, be kind to your friends when they're happy. Be kind to your friends when they're sad. And then the last verse, which is so important. Be kind to your friends as they're kind to you. Remember your friends have feelings too. So this actually, you know, beginning to um, consider to step in the shoes of other people and understand how they're feeling. And of course, there's lots of other things we can do with that. You know, I think someone mentioned it actually in the Have Your Say you know, we can use our puppet to ask, how are you feeling at the start of lessons and to talk about feelings. We can play a game where we throw and catch feelings. I'm throwing you happy feelings now. OK, and we can mime and guess the feelings. And you also mentioned empathy, which is obviously hugely important. And this is something that I think you know, stories play a hugely important role here of moving beyond egocentricity and learning to think of others and not just themselves. And in this story, um, you see Mimi at the table there, and this is a poor Katie kangaroo, and she's on her first day at school, and she doesn't like it at all. And Mimi is really trying very hard to be kind to her. But Katie kangaroo, the only thing she really wants to do is to jump. And when it's announced that the children should go outside, Mimi suggests that they all jump and all the children jump. But of course, Katie Kangaroo is absolutely fantastic at jumping. And at the end, the two become the best of friends. And so that's a lovely way of exploring being kind to others, but in a fictional context. So there's no threat about having to talk about to talk about um, yourself. Another important aspect of social and emotional learning, of course, um, is learning to cooperate. And um, we can do this um, with, a, with a little rhyme or, act, or game that actually talks about cooperation and children actually do it. So let's do this together now. And Louise, are you coming back on to do it with me? <laughs> yes. Okay, so yeah, great. So let's, we just clap yes. and then clap each other's hands. Let's work together. <laughs> let's cooperate. I help you, you help me. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's great.
Let's, let's work together. together. <laughs> let's go let's operate. operate. I share with share you, with you share you, with you me. Share with it's me. great. 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 It's great. Fantastic. Wonderful. We're <laughs> cooperating very well. Considering it's virtual cooperation, I, I think know. we're doing fantastic. <laughs> okay. And somebody also mentioned that cell is to do with learning to manage emotions um, and, you know, to do with learning to, to wait, to not having what you want immediately, to taking turns, to keeping calm. So let's just have a look at a few um, things we can do for that. So, for example, a little settling down rhyme. I'm quiet as a mouse, as still as can be. No noise at all. Look at me. Okay. And then there we got all the little mice sitting quietly and then we can begin our activity. Or for example, at the start of circle time, sit down, cross your legs, hands together, just like me. Ready to learn, ready to play. Let's start our lesson. One, two, three. And I've also included here um, a mindfulness chant. Some of you may be familiar with mindfulness. It's certainly very popular in many UK preschools and primary schools at the moment. So this to do with focusing on the present moment to calm children down and prevent anxiety. So you can do this with me at home. I breathe in, I breathe out. One, two, three. I close my eyes, I listen, I'm as calm as can be. And then the second verse, uh, we can open the eyes. Okay, and the last area of um, cell that I'm going to mention today, and one that is actually particularly important, well, it's important for everyone, it's also important for us, but it is also particularly important for children who are really, you know, getting ahead and learning English, and we are scaffolding their learning to produce that kind of um, achievement. And this is to do with the willingness to make an effort. And anyone who's familiar with the work of um, Carol Dweck on developing a growth mindset, so actually getting our children to believe that um, if they make an effort, they can um, achieve achieve things that they that they that they want to achieve so louise are you coming back to join me let's okay. um, let, let's sing yes, this one okay this. off we go listen and sing i can do it if i try Fantastic. We got there in the end. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, we did. Okay. Well, I can do it if I try. You know, it's also, you know, one, the wonderful, one of the wonderful things about a song like this, you know, I can do it if I try and the child is, you know, maybe having to make an effort with something we've asked them to do. You know, we can actually say, 
remember what Mimi sings and actually sing that. I can do it if I try. Okay. And I would also just mention that it also applies to us as teachers. You know, during the lockdown, um, when I did a session with a group of teachers, you know, we, we, were, we were singing. Well, I was singing. I don't know if they were at home. But, you know, I can teach online. It's here to stay. I can teach online every day. <laughs> I can do it I if I try. try. Yes, okay. yes, so it's, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's important for us as well as for the children. And of course, it's wonderful to, you know, to establish that culture of making an effort in the classroom from a young age. Okay, so we're nearly at the, well, we are at the last segment on our wheel now. and. This um, collaborative projects, and I think collaborative projects can be challenging with preschool. And the key is, I think, to get children to prepare something individually that contributes to a collaborative outcome. Because with our very small children, actually for them, you know, the, collaborate, collaboration is a difficult skill. They can't, you can't just automatically expect them to do it at this age. But we can show them um, how, when they make a collaborative effort, the outcome is um, worthwhile and that it is worth that effort. So just a couple of examples of the kind of things that we might do in a project. So here's one um, where actually the children, they make a sort of clothesline of different clothes for summer and winter. But what I would like to highlight here is the importance of visual messaging so that children can see, you know, of course you're going to explain it, but they can actually see the materials they use, they see what they do, and they actually see the collaborative outcome. So that's one example with clothes. And here is another one um, with food, okay, where they're using modeling clay to make um, plates of favorite food. So, and again, the visual messaging is so important and that every child contributes equally um, because they make their their clothes that are going to go on the line or their food that's going to go on the plate and put it together and this this collaborative um, outcome. And I think as we're working through our projects, we need to think of, you know, the typical before, during and after stages. And before, it's obviously really important to motivate children to do the project. They have to want, they have to feel excited about it. And that's, you know, very often we can use our puppet to build up this excitement. And it also helps if you can show an example of the final outcome. You may just show a picture from the book, but if you can actually show an example, that makes it much more real. You also show and name the materials. And this is very important because over time, this is just kind of becomes part of the acquisitional knowledge of the children that they know how to name the different materials, you know, the glue and the colors and the paints or whatever. We need to give clear instructions and guidelines. These need to be staged. And we also need to demonstrate and model the process using a think aloud technique. In other words, you actually talk through what you're going to do. So we're going to choose the colors and we're going to, um, we're going to color the t-shirt or whatever it is, but you go through actually talking about it out loud. And also to teach or remind children of useful language to use during the, the project. Um, can I have the glue, please? I like your T-shirt, you know, whatever, whatever it is. But you need to actually remind children of that. And I think the other thing to say at this point is that different teachers in different schools have different approaches and attitudes towards projects. And if, if you want your project to be as simple as possible, then it's, it's, you, you've got 
templates provided for you um, that the children can use. If you want the project to be um, to take longer, to be perhaps more creative and to be paint based and so on, you can do that as well. But you don't have to. And I think that's really important because I know personally I've often worked in situations where there's no way that I can have children painting during the lessons because the, there's, there's, not, there's not time to do that and to clear it all up. So you, you need that flexibility and to have the options. During the collaboration, of course, you need to monitor but not interfere unless you have to. Use encouragement and praise, that's obvious. The project gives you a moment to be able to actually engage with individual children to ask them questions, um, you know, what, what color are you going to color the t-shirt or whatever it is. You need to also advocate self-help and peer help, so actually actively encourage children to help each other. But stay back if you can, only get involved if necessary, and encourage the use of relevant language and acknowledge this, you know, because, it, because it's absolutely fantastic. And then afterwards, you may get some children, not the whole class, it would be too boring to present their work, but very much, and this is part of CELL, encourage positive feedback by peers. It's great. I like, you know, your banana or whatever they've made. Um, ask reflection questions. Do you think you shared the crayons well during the project? And it doesn't matter if you're asking that in the children's shared language and not in English. I don't think that that, that matters. The important thing is to actually begin that metacognitive process of getting them to think. You can do further activities or games based on the final outcome. In fact, it's a waste not to do this. So for example, how many t-shirts are red? Or um, can you find two plates with bananas or whatever it is? And the last point there, to actually make the team point, the team point being, and I'm sure you know this, many of you as an acro acronym, together, everyone achieves more. Okay, so that really brings me to the end of the session. Um, we've talked through all these six areas. Um, you can see them up there. I don't need to read them all out. Um, and I hope it's given you some useful ideas for really, you know, getting your children ahead in the early years, but having lots of um, creative fun um, at the same time. So that brings me to the end, really. Thank you very much. That was wonderful, Carol. That was really, really inspiring. I think you've honestly laid the foundations or shown us how important it is to lay really good, solid foundations in early years to prepare for success in the future in primary and beyond. Um, and sometimes we, you know, we, we underestimate that and what we can achieve in early years with even exactly. our youngest pupils. That's, that's been fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Now we have time for some questions from the audience. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that we'll open up a question and answer forum now and that is on your screen so i would like to invite you all to ask any questions or send in comments as well if you want to share some own your own experiences as well related to any of the points that carol has 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 discussed in her talk today the different areas of the wheels of learning you may work um, work with projects collaborative projects you may work with learning stations i found the learning stations carol very very interesting that bridge from yeah the the and the bridge from from games to play and the importance of routinized, no, the, 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 the routines and the modeling on the part of the teacher and, and all of that as a way to encourage um, the acquisition and the, 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 the use, let's say, 
yeah, of, of, of the language and not just the language, but also forms of behavior and the thinking, etc. So, I mean, it was incredibly complete. That was wonderful. So, everybody, please send in your comments, your questions. We're getting some very nice thank yous, Carol, from people. People are thanking you very much for, um, for your ideas. And if anyone has a question, um, there might be, um, actually, I was thinking of a question while we wait. Um, in, in, I had a question about uh, moving from, you know, the, 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 the sort of the more repetition to the more independent. In your experience, is there, have you noted, you know, um, a period of time? Is there a kind of normal period of time which children have to go through in order to kind of start to become more? independent in terms of reproducing the language or there, there probably isn't but you know sometimes we have this desire I to know I, is there yeah i think it's i think it's very individual <clears throat> i think it's yeah. very individual and i think also yeah. even individual children you know they they may have months where they don't seem to be progressing yes. very much and then suddenly they leap forward and yes. the, there may be months where you think, actually, have they been taking this in? And then suddenly they start yeah. coming out with language. I mean, I remember yes. once, you know, years ago, having a little girl in one of my classes and she didn't, she, she didn't really speak and she yes. didn't, she, just, she was very happy in the lessons. And, and I just mm. let that and, and, towards the end of the summer term she suddenly yeah. so she suddenly blossomed and started and so I actually realized that you know it had all been going on in her head exactly. and I think that's why I also feel passionately that we should never force it you know I was going to say I think that's a really a key point to make and you've shown with the examples that you've just given us that um children can surprise you they're assimilating they're assimilating they have their own process and then it comes out and it comes and starts and bursts and it's not a linear thing no exactly exactly and i think what i think the thing for us is it's it's very easy for us to forget how often how much you know children need these models they need them repeated repeated and repeated in the same way that they also need repeated how they're expected to behave you know when they yes. come into our classes they they don't know how they're supposed no. to behave so how can we expect them to behave as we want unless we really train them and and exactly. the same with the language the language use you know they they, exactly. they need those models and that and that gives them this confidence and then they start yes. saying they, they, they I love it when they say you know oh, it's easy you know it's so easy I <laughs> <laughs> you Every think, yes, that's, that's, that's yes. It. we're really you, getting there we're making progress we're really advancing that's wonderful yeah. absolutely and we um there's a lovely comment here that I would like to share I think that what you've been doing uh, uh, during this session is what we have to do with our pupils, to be so enthusiastic, expressive, feel happy with what we're doing. Thanks a lot for all your ideas, Carol. What, a, what a lovely but, comment. Thank you. A, Thank you. Yes. But, but, Thank but, you very but much. Teach by, by, by example, which is exactly. just the I point mean, I, that, that you made. I think I think you know because you you transmit your enthusiasm, passion, whatever. You know you're going you're going to transmit. That. You can't help transmitting it, and it's catching, and that is also what draws children in to using language. Yes. And they may, you know, for the first few weeks, kind of look at you as if you're sort of you've come from the planet. <laughs> somewhere <laughs> or you're completely mad oh, but then they gradually person. but then they but then they join in you know little by little so and yeah. they also watch their their peers what you said about you know the, the influence of the peers they see their peers and, and and they learn from them as well it's not just from the teachers so it's it's a 
incredibly um, um, organic sort of process, isn't it, as well? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I think by trying to, you know, by working on these chunks of language, you know, because I do feel absolutely passionate that if we want our children to get ahead, it's got to be more than just, you know, naming the vo vocabulary items. But at the same exactly. time, if we work on these chunks of language, every child can still participate successfully. Okay, there's always going to be some children who won't get their mouths and heads around those chunks of language but, and that it it doesn't matter if they no. don't um no yeah no no absolutely not so catering for different needs in the classroom but challenging at the same time not to underestimate children's ability i think that's right no i think sometimes mm -hmm. we do sometimes we do maybe you know work to the lowest common denominator whereas actually Mm -hmm. um we can be a bit more aspirational without without but still being inclusive mm -hmm. and allowing mm -hmm. everyone to succeed at the mm -hmm. level they're ready to exactly do so. exactly that's that's a really important point absolutely okay um let me just check if there are any um somebody is asking is this session recorded yes it is the session is recorded and we'll send that to you in approximately one week's time okay carol there are very few other questions to be honest with you there are only there, there seems to be just really positive comments here really really positive people are thanking you super interesting thank you carol Thank you very much. It's been very nice, inspiring. So um, thank you for such a wonderful and inspiring session. Thank Lots you. Thank you, Louise. Positive comments from, from our well, audience. It's been, it's been my pleasure to be here. And I look forward to when we can, I can do it if I try in real life. <laughs> exactly, in real life, yes. <laughs> we can, we can. Okay, we can. that's Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'll see you in in a few minutes' time again. Yeah, we'll say okay, goodbye. Okay. Thanks a lot. Together. Okay. Fantastic. Bye. Then. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And now I'd like to introduce my colleague Susanna Lopez. Susanna, good evening. How are you? Good, good evening, Luis. ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo estás? Good evening. Muy bien. Todo muy bien. A todos, no? A todas. Um, okay, so Susanna is going to do a very short presentation of Big Wheel um, for us now. And so, Susanna, todo tuyo. Muy bien, gracias, Luis. Bueno, como decía Luis, eh, vamos a dedicar esta, esta última parte de la sesión, después de haber escuchado las magníficas propuestas que nos ha contado Carol, a contaros pues bueno, lo que nosotros consideramos son los pilares de, del proyecto Big Wheel. ¿vale? Entonces, como punto de partida, a mí siempre me gusta destacar la, la flexibilidad de este, de este proyecto, esto que nosotros llamamos el enfoque hop on cop, hop off, ¿vale? Con esto, lo que queremos transmitiros es la idea de que las unidades didácticas de, de Big Wheel básicamente no están numeradas, sino que se tratan como bloques de contenidos que vosotros podéis trabajar de la manera que nosotros las hemos secuenciado o hacer vuestra propia secuenciación del, del contenido que tenéis en cada uno de los niveles. Además, eh, los contenidos que se consideran genéricos, como son los números, las formas, los colores, se han colocado al final del cuaderno de trabajo de los alumnos para que vosotros los podáis introducir y podáis ir trabajando eh, como consideráis adecuados y en el momento en que consideréis adecuados. Entonces, diríamos que BeWheel no, no es un proyecto, no es un material, para el que yo tengo que adaptar mi, mi programación de aula, sino que el proyecto se adapta a mi programación de aula de área e incluso a mi programación de curso, porque puede que queráis hacer que estos contenidos temáticos, que estos centros de interés que se están trabajando en el área de inglés, coincidan también con los que se están trabajando en castellano, por ejemplo. Bueno, dicho esto, pasamos al siguiente punto, que es la educación en valores, el aprendizaje socioemocional 
que destacaba antes y, y que, sobre el que ya hablaba Carol anteriormente. En este caso, para nosotros es muy importante este, este tipo de contenido, que sabemos que además trabajáis de una manera muy transversal en todas las, en todas las áreas que se trabajan en infantil, y el área de inglés pues no, no puede ser menos. Por lo tanto, va a tener una presencia en todas estas unidades temáticas de las que, de las que yo os hablaba anteriormente, en, en forma de historia, y también con una canción que los niños pueden cantar, interpretar, bailar, bueno, pues como veíamos antes que estaban haciendo Luis y, y Carol, por ejemplo, ¿vale? Eh, bueno, el tercer punto a destacar, algo que, que, que se destaca como recursos de, de Be Wild, es todo el contenido audiovisual del proyecto. Fijaos, en una unidad, en una de estas unidades temáticas, nos vamos a encontrar con cuatro tipos de contenido audiovisual diferente. Por un lado vamos a tener una historia animada, interpretada por Mimi y su familia, como veis ahí. A esa historia le sigue una canción, una canción cuyo objetivo es trabajar el vocabulario que se ha presentado en la historia anteriormente. Tenemos también estos vídeos que llamamos de cultura, donde los dos niños con su tío, que también Caro lo mencionaba anteriormente, nos van, a, bueno, nos van a poner en diferentes situaciones, con rimas, con chants, con canciones, nos van a presentar diferentes eh, con, contenidos de la cultura británica. Evidentemente todo ello um, en un contexto muy, muy, muy eh, cotidiano para los alumnos, para la edad que tienen los alumnos con, las, con los que estamos trabajando. Además de esto, el cuarto tipo de, de vídeo que tenemos, como os digo, en cada una de las unidades, ¿vale? Son los vídeos de speaking, donde se establece una situación comunicativa y aquí se van a trabajar algo que consideramos muy importante, que son las life skills, las habilidades de vida. Y nos vamos a encontrar pues, con contenidos del tipo eh, tomar decisiones, interactuar con otros, compartir, etcétera. Como os digo, en un lenguaje muy adaptado a la edad de los niños con los que, de la de los niños de infantil pero con contenidos muy significativos para, para ellos. Lo mencionaba también Carol, pero quiero, quiero eh, hacer un, mucho más énfasis incluso sobre eh, este, este contenido, que son los proyectos que, que aparecen en todos los niveles. ¿vale? Eh, bueno, por supuesto, hay una propuesta de aprendizaje cooperativo, hay una propuesta muy pautada, tanto para el alumno, es decir, las instrucciones que, que tiene el alumno con las que va a trabajar, que nosotros mismos los profesores se lo vamos a explicar, pero también una amplia propuesta de trabajo en la guía didáctica, en las notas para el profesor. ¿vale? Aún así, a pesar de que es una propuesta muy pautada y también lo comentaba Carol, sí que esto va a dar lugar, eh, tiene mucho espacio, diríamos, para la creatividad. ¿vale? Por lo tanto, los alumnos sí que van a tener ese espacio para hacer su propio producto final, por así decir, dentro, de, dentro del proyecto. Eh, los proyectos son, están, están, ahora vamos a ver en, en un momento cómo se distribuyen dentro del material, pero sí que me gusta también eh, comentar que son totalmente opcionales según el tiempo del que dispongáis, ¿vale? que están ahí para, para utilizarlos si consideráis que tenéis tiempo suficiente para realizarlos. Bueno, hablaba yo de, las, de cómo se distribuye el contenido, ¿vale? Decíamos al principio que Bibuel es un material, es un proyecto muy flexible en lo que a contenidos se refiere, también en lo que a necesidades eh, según contexto se refiere. ¿Qué quiere decir esto? Podemos ofreceros dos versiones diferentes del proyecto, una que diríamos estándar y otra que diríamos Bibuel Plus, y, eh, bueno, esto tiene que ver con el contenido, con la cantidad de contenido que os vamos a ofrecer en una o en otra. En el caso de, de Big Wheel Standard, lo que vamos a encontrar son seis unidades temáticas con tres proyectos por nivel y una unidad Start, ¿vale? Como decíamos, los, por supuesto, más todo el material, el contenido que, que yo indicaba anteriormente de festivals eh, y contenidos genéricos que aparecen al final. Y en, en el caso de la versión eh, Plus, ¿vale? la versión que diríamos ampliada, vamos a tener ocho unidades temáticas por nivel con ocho proyectos, es decir, un proyecto por cada una de las unidades más una unidad Start. ¿okay? Eh, bueno, eh, como decía, 
depende un poco de vuestras necesidades, de vuestra necesidad de, eh, según la, la carga lectiva que tengáis en cada uno de vuestros centros, de vuestros contextos, eh, la versión Big Wheel Plus la recomendamos para aquellos centros que tienen ampliación horaria o que son eh, propiamente centros bilingües. Y enlazada con esta idea de, del centro bilingüe, también quiero destacar que el vocabulario que se trabaja en los tres niveles de Big Wheel es un perfecto, eh, es, es un, una, digamos que es un trampolín ideal para aquellos alumnos que cuando llegan a primero de primaria pasan a dar contenido curricular en inglés como puede ser Natural Science, la asignatura de Ciencias Naturales. ¿vale? Esto es algo que tenemos que tener en cuenta y que lo tenemos que ver como un, como un beneficio de trabajar con el proyecto. Bien, eh, ¿qué le ofrece o qué componentes va a tener el alumno eh, que trabaja con Big Wheel. Pues por un lado, ya lo venimos mencionando, el cuadernillo de trabajo, ¿vale? Que como veis ahí, eh, está, eh, viene con espiral, pero viene con espiral en la parte superior para que no haya ninguna dificultad ni para diestros ni para zurdos eh, a la hora de trabajarlo. Y lo digo yo que soy zurda y he sufrido mucho este, este, eh, lo de tener a, a un lado, ¿no? La, la, la espiral o el, lomo de, o el lomo del libro. Bueno, eh, entonces os digo, Cuadernillo de trabajo, ¿vale? Para, la idea es para poder trabajar en el aula y además de eso, con, con la idea de que no se termina de aprender cuando uno se va a casa o cuando el, el, el cole se acaba, hemos incorporado una plataforma digital para que el alumno pueda seguir trabajando desde casa, ¿vale? O una vez que está fuera del aula. Eh, ¿Qué tiene de novedoso esta, esta plataforma? Que es una propuesta de actividades interactivas para que sigan trabajando y sigan practicando los contenidos que se han ido trabajando en el aula. Pues bueno, mediante una propuesta gamificada, los alumnos se van a enfrentar a diferentes retos, que como digo, eh, son el contenido que han trabajado en las diferentes unidades temáticas del, del material con el que trabajan en clase y mediante esa propuesta gamificada, van a ir consiguiendo esos retos y van a ir eh, ganando o consiguiendo recompensas. De verdad que este es un material, es un, es un componente altamente motivador para, para los alumnos. Lo vemos en, en, en los diferentes usuarios del, del proyecto. ¿vale? Esto sería para el alumno. Vamos a mirar ahora qué tendría el profesor. Bueno, pues eh, la guía didáctica, con, como decíamos antes, además de una, bueno, un recorrido por lo que pueden ser los diferentes contenidos que se, que se presentan, muchas propuestas, muchas sugerencias, eh, variantes de, de la misma actividad, propuestas lúdicas, didácticas, de todo, ¿vale? En esa guía didáctica. Y junto con la guía didáctica también se incluye un pack de adaptación, donde aquí lo que tenéis son diferentes propuestas imprimibles que podéis llevar a clase los primeros días del curso, especialmente esto con infantil tres años, sabéis que pues nunca sabemos cómo, cómo llegan los alumnos, ¿no? Y también el verano pues hace, hace sus estragos. Entonces son propuestas muy sencillas para que podáis, un, antes de entrar a trabajar con el material propiamente dicho, podáis hacer uso de ellas, ¿vale? Esto en cuanto a contenidos para, o oh, perdón, a componentes para vosotros. Además está el material de aula. Hablábamos de las historias que están presentes en todas las, las unidades temáticas. Eh, vamos a tener, vamos a disponer de estas story cards, ¿vale? Que reproducen las diferentes viñetas de las historias con las que estamos trabajando en el libro y que por detrás, además, tienen el texto, ¿vale? Reproducen el texto para que nosotros los poda, las podamos ir leyendo. Tenemos, además, de story cards, eh, flashcards con todo el vocabulario que, eh, que se trabaja en los tres diferentes niveles. Tenemos ese mat, ese, 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 eh, bueno, esa rueda que nos mostraba antes Carol y que además de para presentar el vocabulario, como decía ella, pues puede darnos eh, juego para muchísimas propuestas lúdicas que vienen, muchas de ellas, muchísimas, en, eh, en la guía didáctica, como os decía. ¿vale? Tenemos también los CDs de aula, por si, por si los queréis seguir trabajando de esta manera, y por supuesto, Mimi, nuestra mascota, estrella del, del material Be Wheel. Bien, esto en lo que a eh, material de aula y material impreso, físico, que vosotros vais a tener para poder trabajar con, eh, con el proyecto Be Wheel. Pero además, además, Be Wheel nos ofrece un amplio soporte tanto digital como pedagógico. Empiezo por, por la parte digital, ¿vale? 
Eh, lo mismo que decíamos, que los alumnos van a tener acceso a una plataforma digital que pueden trabajar en casa, con sus familias, etcétera, y que les hace toda esa propuesta gamificada, vosotros, profesores, vais a tener ese acceso con todos los contenidos digitales que podéis trabajar en pizarra digital, ¿vale? Esto por un lado, pero la plataforma no es solo eso, no son solo los recursos de aula, sino que también vais a tener la oportunidad de hacer un seguimiento del material que los, perdón, del trabajo que los, profe, que los alumnos hacen en, en casa a través de esa plataforma, de esa plataforma gamificada. Por lo tanto, si así lo deseáis, podéis crear diferentes grupos que os permitirán ver qué trabajo extra, ¿vale? Qué refuerzo está haciendo el alumno en casa en, en esta plataforma de la que os hablaba. Entonces, tenemos por un lado nuestros propios contenidos para trabajar en pizarra, tenemos ese seguimiento que podemos hacer del trabajo de los alumnos en clase. Tenemos también eh, esta sección que llamamos Tap and Teach, ¿vale? Que básicamente lo que busca, y esto sabemos que es importante, es ahorraros tiempo en planificación de clases. Por, por lo tanto, lo que vais a encontrar aquí es una propuesta muy secuenciada. También os digo que totalmente adaptable y personalizable a lo que vosotros queráis, ¿vale? Pero como punto de partida puede ser algo que os ayude a encaminar las diferentes sesiones, ¿sí? Y en lo que a soporte pedagógico se refiere, pues no estáis solos, por supuesto, Macmillan está con vosotros, pero además contamos con una serie de vídeos que Carol presenta y que nos, eh, bueno, están, están basados en, en, en clases auténticas y que nos dan infinidad de ideas también para trabajar en el aula, ¿vale? Esto también lo tenéis aquí desde la plataforma. Pues dicho todo esto, y en muy poco tiempo he intentado destacaros lo más significativo de, de nuestro proyecto BeWheel, ¿vale? Voy a dar paso a Mimi, antes de que vuelva a pasar con nosotros Luis, por si tuvierais alguna pregunta en referencia a nuestro proyecto. Muchas gracias a todos. Muchas gracias, Susana. Muchas gracias. Many thanks. Yes, if anybody has a question, as, as we did before with Carol, you, you uh, on your screen you can write in comments or questions. If you do have any comments or any questions to ask Susanna now regarding um, this course, Big Wheel for pre-primary, please do so now. And we'll just give people a couple of seconds. Vamos a darles un par de segundos, ¿vale? Me gusta mucho, claro, es que los vídeos de Carol son espectaculares, ¿eh? También aquí, sí, sí. Hay tanto soporte, ¿no? Claro, sí, les engancha, engancha, sí, pero las ideas, ¿no? Este soporte pedagógico, tanto en el guía, ¿no? De, para el profesor, pero también en la plataforma, también aquí, con estos vídeos que, que, que son de una persona que conoce a fondo este, estas edades y, y ha trabajado tanto, tantos años y tiene tantas ideas um, a compartir con nosotros. Creo que es un lujo, es un lujo. Sí. Um, no tenemos preguntas, uh, Susana, tenemos comentarios. Thank you so much for this very informative uh, session. Um, ha sido muy clara la, la presentación también, alguien dice. Uh, para mí también ha sido muy claro, así que no, no vamos a estar más tiempo de la gente. La gente ha estado conectada con nosotros, ha been with us now since uh, six o'clock, and now it's just past yeah. half seven, and I'm sure everybody would like um, to, to, to have a break now, but it's been wonderful that you've all been here together with us. Carol is back. Thank you so much for coming back, Carol. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful talk, wonderful talk. And thank you, Susanna, for that very clear presentation. It's been great to show all that this wonderful course has to offer. Um, it's been a real pleasure to be here with you. And, and actually a lovely way to round off the season, I think. We've done a lot of events this year, but it's been lovely, Carol, to be able to do this with you. 
in 2021 and round off this year's season of, of events with this wonderful course and wonderful session. So thank you so much. And well, thank just you as well, Louise and Susanna. Thank you for your yes, wonderful sir. presentation thank as you. well. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And it's great and to just see a you. <laughs> yes, it's great to be here. And hopefully we'll be able to meet each other in person in the not too distant future. I do hope so. Um, Ojalá. We can do that again. <laughs> Ojalá, exactly. Ojalá. So that's it. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Susanna. And thanks to all you teachers out there. And I really wish you all the very best possible end to what's been a tremendous year for everybody, but that you've done a fantastic job. So thank you. And see Absolutely. you next yeah. course. <clears throat> okay. Bye. Mm -hmm.